name is Lisa Oakley and I am Vice President and Curator of Education with the East Tennessee Historical Society and we thank you again for being here. I wanted to just take a quick minute to introduce someone. Um, Allison Vick and I have worked together in a number of capacities. She, like I, uh, we are both public historians. Um, Allison is from here as I am and has stayed in the area, studied history at UT and found herself as I did in this wonderful opportunity to work with public audiences and with scholars and with students and with teachers um, to tell the story of history. And she does that both as an instructor and teacher at Pellissippi State Community College, but also in her role that's going full-time, I understand, as historian with the Tennessee Holocaust Commission, which does incredible work that she will share more with you on, and she is around. So please, afterwards, find an opportunity to visit with her, learn more, um, because that, as with me, that's what she thrives on, and that's our mission. So. Anyway, so Allison, thank you for being here, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to everybody for coming and having me here today. So when I first started with the position, I was initially a teacher fellow for the Tennessee Holocaust Commission um, after a return trip from Poland, which is when I took the picture that you see on the slide of the gates of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, and I ended up being a teacher fellow for them for a number of years and later began uh, working for them as a part-time historian and then have transitioned to a more full-time capacity with them. Um, but when I began working more directly with them, one of the great comments we would hear across the state in every setting that we visited was, Tennessee has a Holocaust Commission? What is that? Um, and we still will get that a little bit. Um, but we do indeed have a Holocaust Commission. It's been around since 1984. We are part of a legislative arm of the state of Tennessee, so we are um, well, part of, connected to the governor's office. We also have a um, nonprofit arm to our organization as well. Um, but I don't want to get into sort of like, you know, the nuts and bolts of the organization more than that. I want to actually get you into the work that we do, which is a, the greatest uh, professional privilege I've ever had the honor to have. It is an incredible organization and we work with the best of the best kinds of folks um, on a monthly, ba weekly, if not monthly basis. So um, I borrowed our... Hmm. I borrowed our title, uh, Living On from the Traveling Exhibit, one of them that we have. Uh, but what is our mission? Is basically to connect people across and communities across Tennessee uh, through Holocaust education. So what I want to first introduce you to is the image on the slide. This is an engagement portrait from about 1946. Um, post-war and actually in Germany. Um, these are two of our survivors. Tennessee has done a lot of work over the past decades with survivors who are living in our state as well as liberators and their family. This is, these are two people very near and dear to me, um, Sam and Frieda Weinreich. They lived in Memphis for many decades um, and were very, very active members of the community there and in, of the synagogue at Baron Hirsch and very, very privileged to have known and connected with both of them. They were married for 77 years, both survivors of the Wuch Ghetto, as well as Auschwitz and a number of other concentration and also a death camp. Um, so, in short, we're gonna revisit them and you all are going to be my first audience to actually see something at the very end of the presentation. Um, even my coworkers have not seen this yet. But we have been in um, production, post-production of a long, um, professionally done oral history with both Sam and Frida um, that is going to go up on the website in about probably three to six weeks. We're in the final editing stages of that. Um, and so that is, I've got the preview link for it. And I'm going to show you guys just a little clip of it here at the end. So we'll revisit with Sam and Frida here before the end of the presentation. So. This is sort of a basic slide to show you all exactly what we are. You can see, of course, our logo um, for the Tennessee Holocaust Commission. You'll see it on all of our documents and all of our programs and so forth. Um, but I want to start the picture at the top uh, corner here. Um, this is our Holocaust survivor who we work with on a relatively frequent basis. Her name is Marian Weinswag, and she lives in Arizona. So a lot of people ask, well, why is the Tennessee Holocaust Commission pulling survivors from Arizona to come to our schools? Anybody want to take a stab why? Why we often recruit survivors to come who are out of state? 
Exactly, exactly. And this is a conversation that my coworker and I um, have, were part and parcel of in Washington when we did training in January is that we have to pull from many resources to actually get our um, survivors to our students, to our teachers in the classrooms and in our communities. Um, I don't often, we don't really share on sort of a basic principle most of our survivors just because um, they're sort of cherished relationships, but I do know that we work with nine survivors, only one of whom is actually living in the state. So most of the programming that the Tennessee Holocaust Commission does is free to attend, unless it's an overnight trip and that's a little different. But Almost every program is free to attend uh, for students, for community members, for uh, scholars, academics. We do a variety of programming. So in the picture with Marion at the top, you see um, a young woman whose family gave us permission to use this photo, um, who's one of our student ambassadors in Nashville. Um, and we will talk more, I'll tell you a little bit more about that program in a minute, but wonderful, wonderful young woman who brought a lot of attention to the Holocaust in her school in Nashville. And then at the bottom, I'm a historian, so I'm not really great with technology and all those kinds of cool things like digital mapping. Um, so this is a really rough map, but it shows you the basic idea of the where across the state we've done programs in the past 18 months. Um, a lot of people will say, well, do you do programs outside of Nashville? And the answer is absolutely. Um, we have done ones at Johnson City, Chattanooga, Knoxville, Greenville, Memphis, Jackson, um, Union City. So we really do try to reach across the state. And my coworkers are all in Nashville. There were a team of four with two interns. Everybody except me lives in Nashville. Um, so between the, all of us, we really have Nashville to, towards Johnson City that we go in fairly regularly. Um, and we do try to make it out towards West Tennessee more, um, but that is still sort of one of our main regions we want to engage further with. So what exactly do we do? Um, this is a, uh, more text than I usually like, but it gives you a good breakdown of the type of programs that the commission offers. And again, the first thing we have, if you pull, go to our website, is a speakers bureau. So you can, and basically what this is, is your way to reach out to us and say, I want a speaker to come to my community event, to my school, I want a professional development kind of event. Um, and again, this is all free for people to attend, for the public to attend. Um, and so, let's say you want a Holocaust survivor to come. You could go to our speakers bureau, fill out the forms, and request a speaker if you're a school or again or a teacher for your classroom. Or you could simply reach out and email any one of the staff and we will get back to you fairly promptly and say, let's work it out. We really work hard between all four of us to honor all of those requests because all four of us, I could not be more blessed with the team I work with. All four of us are absolutely committed to making this work very much our mission, sort of, you know, very passionate about it. Um, but let's talk about real quickly, the student ambassador program is designed for sophomores through seniors, basically in high school. Um, who want to work with us for any variety of reasons to raise Holocaust awareness in their schools. Um, and we have a few of them. They're, most of them are located in Nashville right now because it's a new program, um, but who are working with us to bring survivors to the schools, to bring the children and grandchildren of survivors to the schools, to share their family stories, to bring scholars to their schools. Um, and in turn, of, they not only get the experience of connecting with these people, but often will turn to us, you know, for letters of recommendation when they're applying to um, college or what have you. And we are in discussion about sort of um, developing a small grant to go along with um, student ambassadors. So we also have um, four traveling exhibits that we loan out for free. Um, across the state by request. And usually um, these go out for anybody for as long as they would like. We work with museums, we work with the libraries, the universities, the colleges to bring the different exhibits. Um, Living On is our most famous. It is a, port a gallery of 84 portraits of Tennessee survivors, hidden children, liberators, and um, witnesses to the Holocaust with little biographical sketches. Um, the photographs were done by Rob Heller here at UT Knoxville um, in the early 2000s. Um, very, very popular exhibit that goes out annually across different parts of the state when we honor Yom HaShoah, the annual so our commemoration of the Holocaust. Um, 
one of the more controversial um, sort of exhibits that has provoked a lot of reaction, both the positive and sort of, sort of some skeptical um, reaction, is the perpetrator's exhibit, which I am um, fascinated with because the gist of this is, again, artwork that depicts some of the most heinous of the high-ranking Nazis um, who were connected to the final solution, and it depicts them as, if you will, ordinary men. Um, so the point being that we want to not really, you know, pro pro uh, provoke sympathy in any sort of way, but show the audience these were ordinary human beings capable of doing horrific activities under these circumstances. Um, and it was recently here in Knoxville for Yom HaShoah. It was in Chattanooga recently. Um, so really powerful exhibit. And then one, my personal favorite is the artwork by Nellie Toll, who was a hidden child in the Holocaust. Um, she was hidden with her mother. And in short, she depicted, uh, to sort of cope with the stress of being a hidden child, she lived um, through basically watercolors. So it was her outlet. And she created any number numbers of um, watercolor paintings depicting everyday pleasant life prior to the Holocaust. So we have a set of those images that we loan out. Um, and then the most recent one is what we call Nuremberg to Nuremberg. It's a timeline from 1933 through the Nuremberg trials, um, sort of a, uh, de depicting the major events of World War II as well as the Holocaust. So this is a lot of information, I know. And I promise we're going to get to some of the more evocative images and so forth here in just a little bit. Um, so, and then we also do run a student art and essay contest um, for middle school, high school, and community college level. There's cash awards attached to prize winners. There is also um, public recognition of the teachers and of the students that would go out through our newsletter as well as on our website. And then lastly, one of the main features that my coworker and I have just developed is we have a request a professional development program. And it can be, these actually can be tailored to the school's needs. And again, it's free for the schools to host. Um, so these can be PDs, or they can often sort of um, kind of double dip, and we can adjust them to be more designed for students as well. Um, and they're based off of the requests that we have had from the school systems that we work with. Um, either myself or Ken will frequently go out and do a presentation for eighth grade English, for example, on the history of the Holocaust. Eighth grade English, they're often reading the diary of a young girl or night. Um, and a lot of teachers aren't comfortable teaching this material, so they'll turn to us and say, can you come give a presentation? Um, so we'll often do like what we call a Holocaust 101 for middle school or high school. Um, we will do specific topics in the Holocaust for teachers who are doing PD hours, PD workshops. We do a, uh, sort of inspired by Ken Burns, we do a whole presentation on Tennessee and the Holocaust. Um, what, did we, what did Tennesseans know? How did they react? Uh, we do uh, workshops about pedagogical approaches to teaching this material through art, through music, um, you know, and sort of best practices. Um, my coworker, Ken, is a second generation speaker. His father survived Mauthausen. So he will often go out on the road from one corner of the state to the other to share his father's story. His father's name, Armin Gluck. Um, and so he talks about his father and how his father was able to survive Mauthausen. And then lastly, the one that I'm most heavily involved with is based on training I had completed in Washington and other, other places as well about, in light of the past year, countering anti-Semitism. Um, and so this is sort of practical, hands-on, interactive um, sessions in which we work with teachers to talk practically about how do we counter um, and confront rising anti-Semitism, particularly with a you know, focus on uh, anti-Semitic messaging and so forth that you might see on the internet. In addition to all of that, we offer other resources such as our Survivors Archive, which this was originally done in the early 2000s. I want to say it was put on the website in about 2009. Um, we have over 80 hours of oral histories that were completed in about the 2000-2003 period with survivors, liberators, um, hidden children, refugees um, who tell their story. And you usually have the option to watch it in the complete full length or you can watch a shortened version that you can use for the classroom if that seems more appropriate. So we do try always to think of 
what are the teachers' needs? What are the students' needs? What are they realistically going to be able to handle in a classroom? Um, and each of the Survivor's Archive videos has a portrait and a short biographical sketch, is usually, usually the transcript as well, and some writing prompts that go along with it. We offer also free educator resources. We will supply books to teachers frequently across the state, often, of course, Diary of a Young Girl, as well as Night uh, tend to be the two popular ones. Um, with the community colleges, we've unsurprisingly been handing out copies of Ordinary Men not too, uh, fairly recently. So we do really try to work with um, all kinds of schools at every level, private school, home school, public school, colleges. Um, to supply them with resources. And then the last one, I'm gonna actually hold off on mentioning any too, um, in depth too much, because it's my, if you will, pet project within this. Um, but we'll come back to looking at the Ask the Experts here in just a little bit. And I'm, I'll let you all have a break, and I'll sort of play you all a clip of that here in a minute so you can hear them speak instead of me. But this is the fun slide for me. Um, enough about sort of the nuts and bolts, right? Let's talk about who actually comes to Tennessee. Who do we work with? So these, this is why I say this is the most sort of privileged kind of position I, posit, I ever imagine I'll be in. Because the people I'm around, from our students and teachers who are invested in this work, to our scholars, to our survivors, and our second and third generation are just the most incredible people I've ever had the fortune to know. Um, so does anybody recognize anybody on the slide? Anybody deep enough in the world of Holocaust to recognize any of these figures? I know some of you are. So top corner, one of my favorite people in the world, Father Patrick Dubois. Um, he is a French Dominican Catholic priest. He is also the pioneer of the field of the Holocaust by bullets. Totally, as he would be the first to say, almost by fluke, almost by accident. Um, and I will say that his, father, his grandfather um, was imprisoned in Ukraine during World War II um, and always told Patrick, he said, you know, I would ask my grandfather about World War II and he wouldn't tell me. And he said, well, my camp was better for me than it was for everybody else. And he goes, well, who was everybody else? And he found out, of course, the Jewish people. So Father Patrick in the early 2000s basically uncovered what we know now as the Holocaust uh, by bullets. This is a short version of the story. Um, but basically started working with witnesses across Eastern Europe to help locate mass graves that, of Jewish people who had been murdered. Um, his organization is called Yahad and Unum, um, a, a, you know, sort of an interesting name, but I'll save that story for later. Um, and in short, he is internationally recognized as a leading pioneering authority in the field of Holocaust studies. Um, he also works... Um, when I last heard from him, he was in Iraq on the ground doing work um, with basically witnesses to the persecution of the Yazidi people in Iraq. Um, and he also does work in eastern Ukraine and Guatemala as well. So his team, Yahad, has been on the ground since, I want to say, the fall after uh, the invasion of Ukraine. So he spoke for us in Nashville back in the spring of 2023, and we have developed a very close relationship, our team, with Yahad and Unum, as we will see soon. And we're hoping, we're actually in discussion with their team now to about doing more events with them in the near future. Um, top center um, picture here is of Dr. Christopher Browning, internationally recognized for his you know, seminal work, Ordinary Men, Police Battalion 101. Um, also one of the expert witnesses in the famous trial of Deborah Lipstadt and, er, and, um, and David Irving that took place in uh, London back in the early 2000s. We recently partnered with Middle Tennessee State University, bring Dr. Browning there um, to great success. And stu graduate students at the program in particular um, were allowed to kind of have like a lunch with him as well. Uh, in the center, we have Alex Kaur, who is the famous, uh, his mother was famous Eva Kaur a polarizing but very uh, famous Holocaust survivor. Alex is one of the nicest humans I have ever met. He was here in Knoxville speaking for us um, on Yom HaShoah last, what, last May. We did a late Yom HaShoah, so it was early May. And um, those are two of our teacher fellows behind him who have just gotten his book signed. Um, and then the bottom picture I have, I should point out this is our, one of our survivors we work with, Anya Baum. Um, down in the bottom corner in the yellow sweater. That was her at Yom Show in Oak Ridge two years ago. Um, and of course, the sort of rock star image I love is of Dr. Ephraim Zuroff 
from the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Jerusalem. Um, so he actually came to Pellissippi State, um, and he went on to tour much of the rest of the state with us. Again, these were all community events that were free for anybody to attend. Um, we usually have people register, but you can always just show up too. Um, but he was incredible. Dr. Zuroff is widely known as um, the legitimate last Nazi hunter in the world. And so he has had some incredible stories about what it was like to make the arrest of people like Dinko Shakic, who was the commandant of Yasinovitz concentration camp. Um, really tough as nails, gritty guy, but fun and just a blast to work with. And then, what do we do for teachers? And what do teachers do for us, right? Um, we have a wonderful relationship with teachers throughout the state. And since we're in Knoxville, I'm going to talk about this image in the top corner. It's a little hard to see because um, it's small. But you all might, if you all can put, your, you know, sort of see from a distance, you all might recognize who's presenting for us. Um, with the screen with the image here on the back. That was an educator workshop that was for about, we did, I think we had about 15 teachers come, 20, something like that, um, in January a couple years ago here in Knoxville. And that's Dr. Dan Magalo from UT um, giving a workshop about photography and film and the Holocaust. Um, and basically with an emphasis on resist, um, the complexities of rescue and resistance. Um, directly below that image is the Yahad and Unum team with about 20, 22 of our teachers and teacher fellows in Johnson City last fall. Um, we did two extremely long but very significant days on investigating, if you will, the Holocaust by bullets. Um, a lot of interactivity, a lot of close friendship was made by the teachers, particularly on the second night when we had not one, not two, but three fire alarms go off from about midnight to 4 a.m. There was a lot of grumbling going on, um, but we had a lot of fun, um, which is always sort of a key thing to have when you're talking about the Holocaust and you're living with this kind of material day in and day out. You know, it's nice to be able to also find ways to parcel in sort of some good non-Holocaust related types of topics too. I'm gonna have some fun. So if there's one event I am super proud of, it was the June conference that we hosted in Nashville two years ago. We reached out, my coworker Ken and I, to leading scholars of five different organizations across the United States and said, we're doing a program for teachers, two and a half days in Nashville. Um, we re the focus was on women of the Holocaust, and we said we really would love for you to be there. Every single organization who we contacted could not say yes fast enough. They said we would love to go to Tennessee. Absolutely we want to come. Um, so we had Yad Vashem there. We, had, we have very close ties with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We had Jewish Partisans Educational Foundation. We had Holocaust survivors there. Um, and this was all for teachers. Because it was an overnight event, um, we had a nominal, it's like a $35 cost for teachers, and they left with bags of resources, with flash drives, with autographed books by these eminent scholar, preeminent scholars in the field, um, and also developed close bonds with one another. Um, so we really, really have had some extremely good relationships made, particularly in the past two years with leading scholars and organizations that do this kind of work um, across the country. And I will say that we've really built close ties to other organizations and surrounding states that do similar type work. And we often lean on each other for that. Um, we have particularly close ties with North Carolina, actually. So about the teachers. They are still talking about the most recent event we did with them about four weeks ago. Um, it was so much fun to be on, on social media and see the chatter of all of our teacher fellows about this event. We have 54 teachers across the state who are committed to teaching the Holocaust and to really spending time with it in their classroom from middle school to community college up, uh, as well as private and public school. We t and what does it mean to be a teacher fellow? Basically, so long as you honor that commitment and stay active with us, you know, you don't completely fall off the radar, 
you can be, you know, a teacher fellow sort of in, indefinitely. Um, and you get first access to resources, to professional development workshops. We will work very closely with them to bring resources to their schools, whether that is a Holocaust survivor or whether that is delivering a webinar, which we also do. Um, you know, any of that, teacher fellows get first sort of priority with that. Um, and again, it's basically a free, almost always free for them in the schools. But the one the teachers are all smiling about in this picture is we took them on a two and a half day trip to Dallas, day trip, two and a half day trip to Dallas, to the Holocaust Human Rights uh, Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, where we have close friendships with the museum, and they gave us private tours. They connect us with survivors, fit where sort of private you know sessions with survivors. Um, and the reason the teachers are all smiling in this picture down below is, and on the one above, is because um, a lot of them taught eighth grade English and they got to meet Lois Lowry. You all know Lois Lowry, I bet, right? Yeah. Author of, famous author of Number of the Stars as well as The Giver, um, which are, The Giver is often taught in eighth grade. Ironically, my own eighth grade teacher from Oak Ridge, who I read the book with, was on with me on that trip. So it was really fun. Um, but yes, everybody got to meet Lois Lowry, and it was a very nominal cost for the teachers to go with us. I think they paid for their plane flight, and that was about it. All right. So we also make every effort to really keep the students in the foreground, too, of everything that we do. Um, you know, either we work very closely with schools, we work very closely with student, or with teachers, and we really do try to get students connected with survivors to hear these stories. Um, and these are all images that we were told we could use. Um, uh, in short, of student-centered event events um, that the commission has done in the past about 16 months across the state. Now, this is what I was hoping to get at, so that way I could give you all a little bit of a break from listening to me, so you could listen to this sort of the project that we're always developing. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I trained as a public historian. I, was, I had a background in German and history, and then later also in oral history. And so I said, when I started working with the commission, I said, we need to capture interviews with our scholars, our second generation speakers, as well as with our survivors. And they blessedly said, all right, go for it. Um, and so about 14, 15 months ago, I started, when we'd have events with very, very prominent scholars of the field, I'd reach out to them before they came and say, would you mind sitting down and doing an interview with me? And they all would kind of laugh and say, sure. So anyway, we now have those for free on the website and I've modeled them off of um, the writing prompts and questions that go with the interview are modeled off what we see at the USHMM in Washington. Um, so this is six that are on here. There's a seventh on the website and there are four that are in post-production, including the one of Dr. Christopher Browning should be coming out soon, um, and three of our survivors. So in short, there's a lot more that are gonna be coming out. Um, but let's start with the one that everybody always asks me about. Um, and truly, my, my favorite of all of these, if I had to pick, is with Dr. Michael Barenbaum. If you're in this world, everybody knows who he is because he is one of the founders of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He was appointed by President Jimmy Carter to be on the commission when he was younger than me to be part of the uh, organization that would remember the Holocaust and ultimately it developed into the museum. Um, he later went to work for Steven Spielberg. I guess we all have heard of him. Um, worked for Spielberg with the Shoah Foundation, where he captured, uh, and his team captured 52,000 testimonies from Holocaust survivors in the wake of Schindler's List, so late 90s. Um, and then he's won multiple Academy Awards, so no pressure when I was sitting with him, right? Um, so, uh, but no, he, he, was a, he was a pleasure to talk to and uh, really, really fun. So, Dr. Ephraim Zuroff obviously is also a lot of fun to talk to. Very gritty. I had to edit a lot of what he said out because I was like, this is not appropriate for students of any age. Um, so I'll tell you, he is fun. I talk to him about every, every few days. But um, yeah, he's, he's living in Jerusalem right now. So see, needless to say, he's a little bit on edge. Um, and then Tom Wood is one of our commissioners and a very dear friend of mine. He's also considered the definitive biographer of the great Holocaust hero, Jan Karski. 
He knew Karski intimately, knew him very, very well, traveled with him all across Europe, as he'd say, drinking Manhattans, um, and hearing about Karski's personal story during the Holocaust. Um, Anna Salton Eisen, wonderful woman, delightful woman. She, both of her parents were survivors. Um, she is one of the founders of the Colleyville Synagogue, which was held hostage on, what was it, January of 2022, I think, um, in Texas, where the hostage taking took place. That was her rabbi. Um, she's very close friends with Deborah Lipstadt. Um, and just, she comes to every conference we've ever held in the past three years. So she is so much fun. Uh, Sherry Rosenblum, brilliant mind, who talks in this interview about Jewish partisan activity and resistance during the Holocaust. And then one of the other nicest men I've ever met is Benno Kimmelman. Um, he is the son of Mira Kimmelman, an Oak Ridge survivor, who was the first Holocaust survivor I ever met. I was 11 years old when she came to my classroom. Um, and now I work closely with her sons, particularly Benno, um, who helps us guide the student contest. And he shares his mother's story in this. So to give you all a break from listening to me, I just happen to know these interviews so well that I can pretty much usually pull up where I wanted to have it. Um, and for this particular group, since we're talking about military activity and so forth, I think my screen went out. I told you I'm a historian. I don't do technology. Um, in short, um, I thought, well, I'll pick a clip that is sort of relevant for you all. Let's see. Sorry, Dr. Fowler, this happens to me every time at Pellissippi State, too. My students will tell you, like, oh, no, not Dr. Uh, not, you know, Professor Vick again with her technology. Give her a dry erase marker and she'll be all right. <laughs> that is true. Um, very often is to oh, yeah. answer the question, what, and then, um, and where, <laughs> and then to undertake with curators. <laughs> this isn't quite what I was looking for, but we're getting there. Jan Karski was a friend. Jan Karski was a model. And I've met many incredible people in my life. I've had a, a privilege to meet many extraordinary people. The word I used to, and I taught with Jan Karski at Georgetown University for uh, 15 years. The model I use with Jan Karski is I was always in the presence of nobility when I was with him. Jan Karski was a Polish courier who brought information out to the West and met with the different political and party leaders in the West. He had an, a photographic memory, and he was trusted for a very basic reason, because he could compartmentalize information, hand it over from a variety of different sources to different people without telling any person what was not specifically intended for them. In other words, if he was speaking to the Polish government in exile, he could give them that material. If he was speaking to Jewish leadership, he could give them that material. If he was speaking to Roman Catholic Church leadership, he could give them that material. Um, in 1942 and 43, Karski was asked to deliver a message to the world from the Jews in Warsaw. He said, in order to be credible, I have to go into the ghetto. I have to see it with my own eyes. He twice went into the ghetto, and he once was taken to a place called Izbika. Izbika was a way station, a transit point of Jews who were going to Belzec to be murdered. He saw all of that. He then brought the information to the West. He met in, with world leaders. He met with Anthony Eden, who was the Foreign Secretary of Britain. He met with Felix Frankfurter, and I'll tell that story in a moment. He ultimately even met with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. What he had to say was so enormously powerful that when he met in London with the leader of the Jewish Bund and told him what was happening in the Warsaw Ghetto and the day after, or the day before, he had met with an American leader, a man who later became a Supreme Court Justice, the UN Ambassador, Arthur J. Goldberg. 
Um, the combination of the two things meant that Shmuel Ziegelblum wrote an open letter to the world and committed suicide, saying, hoping by my death I can call attention to what was happening. Karski um, told the truth of what was happening while there was still an opportunity to do something about it. He even went public because he could no longer go back to Poland. He couldn't go back to Poland because he was too well known and the intelligence services would have been able to identify him. He also had a demarking on his arms. He had a, a, um, a scar where once he was afraid he would collapse under torture and he attempted suicide, but they brought him back. He met with Roosevelt. He describes his meeting with Roosevelt. Roosevelt, he said, was a lord of humanity, the most powerful man in the world, the man upon whom, whose fate the entire free world depended. He told him what was happening, and he used to do an imitation of Roosevelt. Roosevelt listened carefully, and he said, You tell your people we shall win the war, and then we shall do something about the refugees. 25-year-old Karski, meeting with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the President of the United States, the leader of the free world, says by then it will be too late. And the idea was that America fought one war, the World War. Germany actually fought two wars. It fought the war against the Jews, which was a racial war for the annihilation of the Jewish people, and World War II. They were intensifying their effort to rid the Jews as they were losing the war. There's a moment in his meeting with Felix Frankfurter that's enormously instructive. He says, young man, I can't believe you. The Polish ambassador jumps up and says, on this man's word, we trust men and material. We risk human lives. I swear on the life of my children, he's telling the truth. And then Felix Frankfurter, who is a Supreme Court justice, says something profoundly important. He says, it's not that he's not telling the truth. I'm not calling him a liar. It's that I can't believe him. There is a difference. What Frankfurt is showing is that there was a resistance, an innate resistance to the information that was being conveyed. It is a challenge to our, the very basic premise of our human civilization that the nation of Goethe and Schiller, of Bach and Beethoven, of Kant and Hegel could be the perpetrator of this heinous crime. Not facing that truth was lethal to the Jewish people. And Karski was a truth teller. And he told truth for the very basic element he then went public. He wrote Anatomy of the Secret State. He published in every conceivable magazine. He told us what was happening while there was still time, and we did not do enough. And I will say the last thing he tells me in this interview is like a gut punch to me. It was recorded not long before October 7th, and so I listened to it, and I think, oh, my gosh. And we've talked about it since. He's like, well... That's the way we live, Allison. It's to stay the misery of the world. So um, all of the interviews I'm extremely fond of. Um, if you watch Tom Wood's interview, he knew Karski so well. And of course, you can tell by now I'm a Karski uh, fan for a good reason. Um, he actually has a, a personal recording of Karski speaking in Nashville in, um, I want to say, 95. Um, that we've integrated into the interview as well. So there, are, these are all um, long projects. It takes about a year to kind of do the po production, post-production of them. Um, but I'm very privileged to be involved with like every step of this. The videography team and I work intimately, very closely on this um, all for months at a time. It's a lot of fun. It can be a little tedious when we're transcribing um, uh, survivor interviews and so forth, but definitely a lot of fun as well. Um, so, and these are all ones that I am very, very proud of because these are great people that we've gotten to know and become friends with. So, I should also point out my excellent co-worker, um, Ken Gluck, does a lot of training of second and third generation uh, speakers, children, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors 
who um, always wanted to tell their family's story and did not know how. Ken has an extremely well mapped program to help them de uh, develop their story and then later hopefully go speak for us. So what does the commission have on our sort of radar? In addition to the innumerable um, PD events that Ken and I go to throughout July and August and into November, we're actually doing a um, full PD day of uh, professional development day for teachers in Knox County on election day. Um, ironically. So, um, but we work with, you know, all kinds of events like that across the state. But in addition to those, we have webinars scheduled with um, school systems with survivors. We're working with Secor Foundation to have Mr. Lester, who is a Holocaust survivor in his late 90s, who was about 15, 16 years old when he was at Auschwitz. Um, we're having that delivered in, I want to say, late September. We haven't solidified the date yet. The one I'm deeply invested in, in fact, probably a little too much, I was up late last night working on this, um, is an interfaith series. Um, one of the areas for expansion we're working on is working with the Christian and Jewish theologians and clergy in the state. Um, and I was blessed to have an excellent, excellent mentor and, I, and, my, and the blessing of my commission team that said, go for it. If you want to try to in, in bring these folks into our programs, you have at it. Um, but my mentor was Father John Pawlikowski, who was a Catholic priest who is deeply involved in the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial and Museum, um, appointed by uh, Carter and then later reappointed by George H.W. Bush and Clinton to work on the, on the museum. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to start building the interfaith programs, so webinars that we can bring in, designed specifically for clergy, but also um, anybody who's interested. It will be free. And I said, what do I need to do? And I got a great email on Maundy Thursday from Father John said basically, huh, Allison, good luck. Um, you know, he's like, this is very difficult work that you're going into, not least of which is because every pastor I've ever met, their schedule is very booked up. They are overworked. He said, but if you want to do it, I'm going to help you any way I can. So he's actually kicking off our webinar series in November. I conveniently timed it to coincide with the release of the new Diedrich Bonhoeffer film that's coming out on November 22nd. Um, we have Father John leading um, the, the Thursday after election day, so that's the seventh, right? Um, he's kicking off with a webinar series then, and we have an extraordinary asset at the commission in our uh, and our uh, commissioners, um, one of whom is a rabbi, and he is going to be sharing, his, he's the son of survivors, and he's going to be sharing his story as well as about the interfaith work he does at Belmont University. Um, he's the first Bel um, rabbi on staff in Belmont's history. Um, and then we are going to also have Dr. Victoria Barnett, who is one of the world's leading experts on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, give us a webinar um, a few days before the movie comes out. And she asked me very seriously, she said, do you think I'm the right person to talk about Dietrich? And I said, you absolutely are. She's like, I'm not going to paint over and give you completely rose-colored glasses to him. I said, that's why I want you. I want you to give me the complete, honest version of Bonhoeffer, because I love him. But I do also know that in the States, we tend to a little over-romanticize him um, and his role with regards to the Holocaust. So, and I know the film that com is coming out is doing the same thing, but I'll still go see it opening night. It's on my calendar. It's like, go see this. It's coming out on the 22nd. Um, so I'm very excited about that program. We're in discussion with Patrick Dubois to see if he can join us as give a webinar as well, but he will be in France at the time. So we're trying to work out the time change. Um, and then for clergy who participate, we're doing a virtual tour um, with a Polish guide for them to Auschwitz. Um, so it's live on the ground. The clergy will get to go and be involved with that. Um, and again, it is an interfaith um, sort of program. Um, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is our best friend, so to speak, and they want to pilot a program for us in Nashville on October 22nd for our teachers, which we said, if you want to bring a free program to us, absolutely, go for it. Um, so they definitely are. And one of my other favorites, I have a lot of favorites, you can tell, um, is coming to Memphis, Mark Weitzman. Now, now a lot of people will say, who's that? Um, even people I work with are like, I don't know Mark. And I say, well, you know of him because the definition created by International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance about anti-Semitism and the examples that go with it, as well as Holocaust distortion, that's his work. And he is also the COO of the World Jewish Restitution Organization. 
Buzz, he was a former Nazi hunter. And so this, I can't quite figure this one out. He is a former Nazi hunter, but he's a very chill personality, very relaxed. I'm like, how do those things go together? Um, but Mark is great, and he's coming to speak for us in Memphis. He has, to give you an idea, spoken to Pope Benedict and Pope Francis on matters of contemporary anti-Semitism. He has also spoken to the UN Secretary Generals on the same topics. So he's what we call one of the heavy hitters in the field, for sure. And then lastly, sort of as a teaser of that, this is the one that we're hoping to bring to Knoxville in the spring. The Jan, we work with um, the Jan Karski Educational Foundation, which as you can imagine is all things Karski, wonderful, wonderful organization. They have an incredible traveling exhibit, incredible resources. Um, and so we are hoping to bring that to Knoxville this spring. We're sort of solidifying the details of that now. Um, but the goal being to, uh, in sort of light of Genocide Awareness Month, have it here and um, also have coordinating programs about once or twice a week for the duration of its, of its stay here in Knoxville that go along with that. And then lastly, this is what I wanted to have you guys get to see before I let you guys go to, or have you guys go to lunch or whatever is next on the schedule. Um, this is Sam and Frieda Weinreich um, with two of their grandchildren. They had three children and a lot of grandchildren, lived in Memphis from about 1950, 51 um, until now. Um, wonderful couple that I got to do um, oral histories with, which you saw in their portrait at the beginning of the presentation. It took about s close to a year to get the or uh, oral histories lined up. Sam was just shy of his 104th birthday when I did the oral history with him. He was 19 to 20 when the war, 20 ish, just turned 20 when the war broke out. He was in which ghetto and which Poland. Um, and so was Frida. She was 15. Um, they are both the only survivors of their family. Um, they both lost everybody in the Holocaust. And um, really incredible couple. Um, the part that gets me is I literally had worked and done these interviews. It took probably two-thirds of the day um, to tape these in Memphis at Baron Hirsch Synagogue. Five days later, I got a call from my friend in Memphis who was working with, like, physically sort of helping to take care of the wine racks. He said, Sam's had a bad fall. Sam never completely recovered from that fall and passed away about five weeks later. But he was said he absolutely was on board. He wanted, he knew through my, through my contact, he knew I was trying to come to interview him. So he was like, let's, let's schedule the interview. Let's get, I want to share my story one more time, one more time. So I was able to get to Memphis and record it. And then after Sam passed, um, I got the news from my friend in Memphis again that said Frida's passed away um, within a couple months of each other. So to have that on here, they had been recorded um, individually by USHMM and by Shoah Foundation. Um, and some other sort of informal recordings as well. Um, but never have they had their interviews meshed. Um, by the time I was speaking with Sam, his voice was pretty weak, and we debated and debated, and we had to do a voiceover for him, sort of reluctantly, but again with the thought that this is designed for students, for teachers, ultimately, in the general community who want to make sure they can hear his story. So you all get to be the first audience to see what this is going to look like. I'm not, it's about an hour in full length um, that will be on the website. We're going to also break it into parts so that if you know, somebody's using it in the classroom, it'll make it a little easier. Um, the Weinreich family very generously gave me bunches of photos to build into the, um, into the video. And I should say, of course, USHMM and Yad Vashem are always um, have given us permission to use their photos too and are very gracious about getting what we need to us. So let's see if I can find my link here um, and I'll let you guys hear that. Let's see. Let's see. So technically I'm not supposed to share this link so y'all won't tell on me I hope. Um, let's see. I think that's pretty close. There's Sam. He introduced me. Yeah. This guy can sing for you. So I sang for him and he gave me bread. Anyhow, that's how I sung for him. And I started to get a little more flesh on me. Finally, they told us they opened the wires in the back. Everyone take their coats, their blanket. Take their blanket and go out through the back. 
I knew that something was happening because all of a sudden they tell us they do away with that fence. They cut the fence open for us to go out through the back and we dragged ourselves I don't know how long. We're laying down on the grass waiting near the railroad track and all of a sudden after a day, I don't know, a train came. I couldn't understand. So I lay there and see on the back there were two cattle cars, but these cattle cars did not have a roof, no roof on it. Open, in the back was a soldier standing there. And they bombed the train a week after we came off of the train. We could not drag ourselves. Sit down next to me was a young boy, Manek. There's a forest. The forest was not too far. I said, come on. I'm not going back on that train. Something is happening that hasn't happened until now. Let's go. We dragged ourselves over, and there were trees all over. Got scratched. We're laying on the ground. Now when you lay on the ground, you can hear what's happening around you. When we laid ourselves out, the guy who was next to me, he says, I don't know what your name is, but I am from Lodz, Poland. I cannot hold out no more. I'm dying. I said, you lived through all of the atrocities. Now, you're going to die? Come on, boy. He told me he was dying. I said, we go to the right. I looked up to the right. We start walking until I see out of the forest more daylight. And I crossed the street. Was a soldier walking back and forth. But on his arm, lapel, I could see that he has an American flag. I knew then that we had survived already. Oh, the Russians really liberated me. The Russians, well, we stayed in Parsnitz for a while. And then when the train started to run, I don't rem I cannot know how long. I cannot remember how long. I went back to home. With three girls from Lodz, we went back. I wanted to see if I survived. Maybe somebody else also survived. You don't know what you can survive. So I went back. We came in the middle of... Po uh, Luge was liberated in, ja in January. And they liquidated the ghetto in the end of August. So the Russians were not far then. So I, w I went back. There was... I did, we didn't know where to go. It was in the evening. From inside the kitchen came a guy. He must have been a chaplain. He talked a little Yiddish. He talked to us, don't not eat this food because you die. A lot of your people die from hunger because they ate the wrong food. They'd taken us into another building not too far from there. There were more people. There were even Russian people there too. And that's where we used to get farina and milk. Farina put the body back to life. Finally, a guy with a motorcycle had taken us to Landsberg am Lech, and then I knew I'm already free. I'm going to pause it there because I know we're short on time, but if you all have questions at any point, I'm certainly happy to answer those. And thank you all again. Thank you to ETHS for having me, and I hope you all have a great rest of the conference. So, yeah, it's all Yes, very much so is the short answer. So that is why I will say the staff of the Tennessee Holocaust Commission, we hear this a lot. And we'll ask the teachers, say, what do you do? And I say, the staff, we are not allowed to touch those issues, but we do bring them to the board. The commissioners are the ones that are most likely to be able to discuss these matters at more at hand. And um, we are always 
looking for new ways to integrate the Holocaust into the classroom. For example, we have a, a teacher who from Powell who reached out to me and said, it's the strangest thing. She says, I can no longer teach Knight, nor can I teach um, Julius Caesar. And I thought, well, that's an odd combination. Um, so apparently the school didn't, uh, wouldn't let her teach either one. And she said, what do I do? I want to teach the Holocaust. And I said, what do you want to teach about it? And she told me, and I said, I'm going to get you resources, whether that's eyewitness testimony excerpts, rather that is whatever. Um, tell me specifically what you're looking for, and I can find the resources for you. Even if you can't use these specific ways, we can find workarounds to where you can still work it in. Uh, do you have good interviews? I, I got to meet Amy Roussel um, a, long, a long time ago. But uh, do you have interviews with him that can be shown rather than teaching night? We do not personally have any with him. I can find you one pretty quickly. Okay. So, yeah, absolutely. That's how we're going to get around it. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any pressure on you? Um, and in what regard? I'm sorry. So there's pressure to take these books out of the schools. Is there pressure on you not to do what you're doing? That's an interesting question. Um, let me sort of say this as we have had more support as an organization from the current government in Tennessee than I have seen since I've been working with the Tennessee Holocaust Commission or as a teacher fellow. We are extremely blessed with how our current legislature has been very supportive of us. Um, we will occasionally have a student or something like that ask us or kind of question us, particularly in the past year, um, about why we're doing what we do. But you know, th to me, those are fair questions, and so we just tackle them head on and just say, you, can we stay diplomatic, but we stay honest and say, this is important work. We have to know the history. So usually the pushback's not very much. Yeah. That is one I wish I had our teacher fellows here because much of our conference um, actually revolves around these kinds of conversations. My understanding from listening to our middle and high school teachers is that Anne Frank is being banned for any number of reasons. Um, one, they say it's controversial. Two, because of sort of the, um, I guess, teenage themes that are in the book. Um, they say that these are, have encouraged students to be, quote, you know, promiscuous or something like that. Um, which I thought, man, you have to have a warped sense of reading. Um, <laughs> whew. Okay. Um, and then um, also what we have heard increasingly is that teachers are generally afraid to touch the topic. Um, because they consider the, uh, we've actually heard the teachers say the Holocaust is too controversial to plan around, which as a historian, that bothers me on so many levels. Um, I actually heard that from um, a colleague at another community college in the western part of the state say, we don't know if we can program about the Holocaust because it's too controversial. And I thought, oh my. Where are we now? You know, so um, that is a long sort of answer. But in short, there's a number of reasons why this is being banned. And I believe it is not, to my knowledge, banned as across the state or anything like that yet. But school systems, school districts are banning it because either they're afraid to teach the Holocaust or they're afraid of these, quote, controversial themes inside the diary of a young girl. So... Which I think if you went that route, there'd be all kinds of books you could ban. So I know, right? It makes me think of being in Babelplatz in, in Germany, in Berlin. So um, we'll see. But yeah, it's an interesting question. All right. So I think it would probably warn you're standing here. I'm thinking we're probably about ready for the next uh, thing on the event on the schedule. So oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. She asked us if we were connected to the Simon Biesendahl Center. Um, there's a couple of them. You mean the one in California or the one in Jerusalem? So we are actually more closely tied to the one in Jerusalem. Um, Afriam Zuroff is our contact there, and I talk to him about every week. Um, so we have very close ties to them. 
he's always telling me, anytime you want me to come speak, anytime you want me to come, um, let me know. But he did he did the statewide tour, the three cities with us. So he's he had a great experience. He's like, I want to come back to Tennessee. So we have a very close tie with them in Jerusalem. Um, I know I've used had some correspondence and used some of the resources from the ones in California and different programs that I do, but I don't know them as well. Um, but definitely anything that we need, we want um, from the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Jerusalem, they are happy to supply. Simon Wiesenthal is a cool, and cool guy, interesting guy. So, yeah. I'd just like to make a comment for the group. Uh, a number of years ago at a brown bag luncheon here in this room, a middle school principal north, a little north of Chattanooga gave a talk that there was not a dry eye in the room afterwards. The Paper Clips Project, look that up. At the school in uh, north of Chattanooga, they actually have a box car, a cattle car, whatever you want to call it, that came over from Germany. It's, it's a wonderful story. It is a wonderful story. I'm smiling because two of the creators of that exhibit are our teacher fellows. In fact, I taught, well, they went to Dallas with us, and so we talked to the name, of, it's in Whitwell, Tennessee. Um, so it is a really, it's a neat place, so. I just want to say there's only one standard for the uh, U.S. History High School that covers yeah. the Holocaust, and it's mostly <coughs> how we helped liberate them, and yes. they immigrated to afterwards. That's about it. That's, our standards are pretty vague. Um, we, it begins in fifth grade, um, and we have eighth grade English standard, but um, they're pretty broad and vague in what we cover, so. All right, thank you all.